Big Bang, but a much, much larger cataclysmic explosion than that is how our universe began. And as the gas is cooled, stars formed like our sun, and round our sun, planets like our Earth. But the Earth wouldn't be as you know it today, it would be quite different. Its atmosphere, for instance, wouldn't contain the oxygen that you breathe. It might contain carbon dioxide and water and nitrogen and methane and ammonia and hydrogen cyanide, which is very poisonous. And these small molecules were around. But gradually, the carbons and the nitrogens and the hydrogens join together to form much more complex molecules, purines and pyrimidines. And these molecules join together to form the molecule DNA, which is in the centre of all your cells and in actual fact controls the genetic code and makes you all different from each other. And so these molecules gradually join together, not simply to form complex molecules, but eventually to form bacteria and algae, and eventually, as well, the planet was covered with plants. The plants came first because the plants have a very special reaction in them. They're beautifully green, and as the molecules join together and the plant grows, it uses the sunlight and the simple molecules carbon dioxide and water and joins them together to make a much more complex molecule called sugar and also oxygen. And it's the plants that provide the oxygen that you breathe every day. And so that reaction, that chemical reaction which everybody calls photosynthesis, is actually the breath of life. The planet, its rocks, its minerals, the sea, the air all around you, the plants and the animals, everything, the way they interdepend, how they grow and how they live, that's what we're going to talk to you about. That is chemistry. The world is chemistry. If you lived on this planet, as it was when the plants and the animals first evolved, you wouldn't recognise it. It wouldn't be the world that you live in today. The reason that many of the things you use every day just wouldn't be there. We have to take the rocks and the minerals from the earth and the things from the sea and the chemicals in the air and use them to make all these everyday things that make your life as it is. We've known for very many years that we can take rock and clay from the earth and turn it into pots and sand from the desert and turn it into glass. And it's rocks and minerals like these that contain in them beautiful crystal structures. This one's called galena and this one is called malachite. And the one over there at the end of the bench with its nice mauve crystals is amethyst. And these are all solids. The atoms are all joined together in very regular patterns. They can't move apart, they're stuck together. And that's what gives the crystals their nice fixed shapes. They might be joined together, but they can vibrate about. Even a mountain vibrates about if an earthquake runs through it. And so the scientist's picture of a, mo of a solid is atoms fixed together, but that they can vibrate. Mike's going to talk to you about what happens if you're looking at a liquid. Right, now as Anne said, in a solid we envisage the particles as just being on average in a fixed position but wobbling from side to side. If that solid is heated up sufficiently, the particles become partially free from each other and can move around. But still they're not entirely separate. And so far Anne's been talking about the Earth's solid resources, minerals and, and what have you, but we need to realise too that liquids make up a substantial proportion of the Earth in the form of the sea. And the other part of the Earth that we're going to show you how we use to make everyday things is of course the air. Now the air is not a solid and it's not a liquid and the difference is that the molecules aren't fixed together like this. They're not all together but free to move around like that. As Mike will show you, that when you think of the atoms, the molecules in a gas, they're on the move all around the room and if they happen to hit you and then they go up your nose and it's smelly, that's how you know they're there. There are lots and lots of gases in our atmosphere 
And if you take the carbon dioxide, which is one of the gases in the atmosphere, and you cool it down enough, instead of being a gas on the move in the way we've shown you with our model, it can become not on the move, fixed together as a solid. And here is some carbon dioxide that you can see has been cooled down until it's a solid. Fixed lumps, atoms not on the move, all joined together. But if we take this solid carbon dioxide and just using some hot water, we warm it up quickly, just like ice will turn to water and to steam when you warm it up. If you warm up this solid, you'll see it turn back into a gas and the gas is on the move all around the room and you'll see that happening quite well. You can see they form a blanket and carbon dioxide has a special property as Mike and John are going to show you. And that is of course an important use of carbon dioxide. The other part of the air, another gas in the air, is the nitrogen. And the nitrogen, if you cool it down, just like the carbon dioxide, the gas molecules will stop moving around and eventually you can end up with the nitrogen as a liquid. Now, this liquid is very cold. The glass of that clear dewar that I'm going to use so you can see what I'm doing is warm, it's at room temperature. And so when this cold liquid hits that warm glass, the first thing you'll see is that the liquid will boil and turn back into a gas. Now, this liquid is very, very cold because when the weathermen say in a winter's night, oh, it's going to be minus 10 outside, you know what it's like in the morning. Suppose they told you it's going to be minus 20 outside. You imagine what it would be like when you went out in the morning. Well, this liquid is at minus 196. And because it's so very, very cold, the liquid nitrogen has unusual effects on other molecules. If you take this nice, bouncy set of molecules, which can vibrate, just like my model, in the rubber, and we put them in this very cold liquid nitrogen, instead of being able to move around, the liquid nitrogen will stop the molecules of the rubber even being able to do this. And so, when I hit that end with the rubber, instead of bouncing, it will break just like a piece of glass. This makes the liquid nitrogen very useful because biologists, bacteriologists, people looking for new vaccines, cures for cancer and AIDS, sometimes need to keep virus cells and bacteria cells or delicate molecules and stop them moving around so they can't react. And they store them in liquid nitrogen. And that's a picture of a scientist lowering some cells into liquid nitrogen so they can be kept. We can show you that here because if we take some nice simple cells like a plant which are not too different from the cells in your body, they're the same sort of molecules, and we put them in the liquid nitrogen. This is what would happen to your fingers if you were silly enough to put them in here. Eventually, it cools down to the same temperature as the liquid nitrogen and if you touch them, then they can't move and so they just break. But if you warm it up very quickly again, as Mike's going to do with the hairdryer, then they're all right. They can move around again and they will go on living as before. It's a liquid, very cold liquid, but just like any other liquid, if you warm it up, it will turn into a gas. I'm not going to freeze your toes, but I'm going to show you it turning back into gas. If you lift your toes off the ground, you'll see my liquid as it goes on the floor. Spreads out and the floor warms it up and it turns back into a gas. 
Imagine what it would have been if I'd been chucking water around and it would have stayed as a liquid, be lots of puddles. But now the nitrogen's gone back into its normal gas form and it's spread out all around the room. There's one more use of the nitrogen that's very important. Nitrogen in the air is turned into a chemical called ammonia, which is used to make fertilizers. And fertilizers are used to grow our plants and our food. If we don't have the right fertilizers and our climate's not very good, then we would have the situation of deserts and famine and you wouldn't have enough food to eat. But our climate's good and we can use the fertilizers to grow crops to provide you with the food that you eat. And that's the use of the nitrogen in the air. Mike's going to tell you about another gas in the air, the oxygen. Well, so far Anne's been talking about the unreactive gas in the air, that's nitrogen. But oxygen, as you'll see in a moment, is very, very reactive. It's what makes things burn, it's what help, help things to burn. So far I've got a piece of wood that's not really on fire, it's just glowing, not doing very much in air. But as soon as we expose it to oxygen in the gas jar there, it burns very, very, very much more brightly. Now we don't always need oxygen in the form of a gas to help things burn. Anne's going to show you two chemicals giving this combustion reaction, but this time one of the chemicals is supplying the oxygen itself. It's not using oxygen from the atmosphere all around us. The chemical that's being burnt is sugar, which is a biological molecule. It's one of the molecules from which we obtain our energy. And if you try and imagine just how much energy is being produced by this teaspoonful of sugar burning, you'll see just how useful sugar is as an energy provider. Another simple combustion reaction I can show you is one involving an element that you may have seen before, you most certainly have, and that's phosphorus. It's one of the ingredients that's used to tip matches. Stored under water, just to keep it safe, so before it will burn, the water needs to be evaporated. And there we go, one of the chemicals that it's producing is phosphorus oxide, and that can be made into other useful chemicals, namely fertilisers. It's burning very vigorously, as you can see. Another element that we can combine with oxygen is sulphur. This burns in air just more quickly, not so vigorously, but when it's in oxygen you can see it burns with a very bright blue flame. And the oxides of sulphur that are being produced can be turned into useful chemicals like sulphuric acid. The main important use of sulfuric acid that you've come across is its use in car batteries. Sulfur dioxide can also be a problem because it's a byproduct of some industrial processes, and for that matter, sulfur trioxide as well. And it's one of the chemicals implicated in acid rain, and I'm sure you've all heard about that recently.